Welcome to ICNI RD's Multimedia Online Resources. This is the first module of the unit devoted to a story of learning mathematics. Great many stories of mathematics learning have already been told, and they may sometimes be seen as competing with each other. This is why the title speaks about a story, not the story. While each one of us may favor one of these stories and call it the best, there is no single version that can count as the story of learning mathematics, the one that is superior to all the rest in some absolute way. The version I am going to present is called cognitive. This word probably does not tell you much, but be patient. Explaining cognition is one of the aims of this unit. Yet before I start these explanations, I have to clarify a number of things. The interest in learning is widespread and fully understandable, but you may wonder why one should bother with mathematics learning of all things. Well, mathematics classroom may be seen as a perfect laboratory for studying learning. Although learning happens to us all the time, it becomes truly visible only when it stops uh, doing its job properly, just like a hammer that breaks. And as we all know, and some of us in a rather painful way, mathematics learning seems particularly prone, conducive to such breakdowns. If so, mathematics classroom is, uh, is the place to visit by those who are looking for a new, potentially insightful stories about learning. I will begin this series, series of talks with the basics. I will ask the fundamental question of what learning is, what is mathematics, and what we mean when we put these two words together and speak about learning mathematics. All this, however, will have to wait till the next episode. In this one, I wish to forestall the obvious question. Why should we spend our time trying to define things as basic and obvious as learning of mathematics? Indeed, all of us use these words and no one doubts their meaning. So why bother? After all, you could say about learning or mathematics what one mathematician said about his wife. I cannot define this creature, but I recognize it when I see it. More generally, why should we talk about how we talk about mathematics or learning? Isn't it a waste of time? Can't we just talk about mathematics and learning directly? One obvious response to this query is that attending to how we talk is necessary to improve communication and to make our stories clearer, unambiguous, and thus more helpful. Even if you doubt the need for such clarity in everyday life, you cannot deny its great importance in stories told by researchers or teachers. But there is also a broader concern, and it is not just about how we say things, but also about what we can say to begin with. While changing the way you speak, you may be changing the story you tell about learning, and this will eventually change the things you do as a learner or as a teacher. I will now try to justify these claims. My first task now is to convince you about what I just said that what you see depends on how you talk. For this, I will use an example. Meet two girls whom my colleague Eric Lavi and I approached to talk about numbers. The four-year-old Ronnie, Eric's daughter, and Ronnie's seven-month-older friend, Einat. At the time our study began, we knew that the girls could already count properly. Irit presented them with two identical opaque boxes. The children knew that the boxes contained marbles, 
and were thus not surprised when the researcher asked, in which box are the more marbles? The question was posed in Hebrew, the language of our participants. The subsequent conversation, which you are going to see now, was also in Hebrew. You can follow it by reading the English subtitles. <laughs> באיזה קופסה יש יותר גולות? בזאת? כן? איך אתן יודעות? כי, כי הכי גדול הרצון. כן, בבקשה. יחי. עינת, איך את יודעת שבזאת? כי, כי, כי היא ענקית יותר מזאתי. כן, היא ענקית יותר מזאתי? כן. ומרוני, מה את אומרת? As you saw, there were two parts of the event. First, the girls chose anonymously one of the identical boxes. And this is what they said. Mother, right. There are marbles in the boxes. I want you to tell me in which box there are more marbles. At this point, Einat points to the box which is closer to her. And Ronnie points to the same box after her. In the second part, the girls answered mother's request for substantiation. Mother said, and this one, how do you know? Ronnie? Because this is the biggest than this one. It is the most. Mother, Einat, how do you know? Einat, because cause it is more huge than that. Mother, yes. Ronnie, what do you say? Ronnie, that this is also more huge than this. Let me add that in the third part, the one I have not shown, the girls when urged by Ronnie's mother to open the boxes performed a glitchless comparison by counting. The main thing I am asking you now to notice is that in the reaction to the question, where are there more marbles? The children chose one of the identical closed boxes and they did, with, and they did it without seeing the marbles. Einat, the older girl, made her choice first, and Ronnie, the younger one, followed pointing to the same box. What happened here was probably not unique. Researchers have documented many events in which children perfectly capable of counting did not count before answering the question, where is there more? Here is how this phenomenon was described in a well-known publication. Children who know how to count may not use counting to compare sets with respect to number. But the description could also be different. Thus, let's call this one narrative one. And here's another possible description, which I will now call narrative two. Children who know how to count when asked where is there more, may still make a choice without counting. But are these two stories really different? Let's take a close look. Well, they are certainly different in form. The wording is different. And yet they can still be telling the same story. But do they? Take a close look at these two phrases, not use counting to compare sets with respect to number versus make a choice without counting. The first phrase, the one on the left, implies that the child tried to compare cardinalities. The second on the right 
leaves open the possibility that the child try to do something else. Something else than comparing the boxes with regard to number. For instance, perhaps the girls were simply showing which box they considered as preferable. Indeed, young children are known to use the, words, the word more for many different things and preferable is one of them. For them, preferable does not necessarily mean bigger. The child may prefer what she sees as nicer, more accessible, or just more attractive in the eyes of somebody else. Thus, how about this explanation? The older girl preferred the box that was close to her, closer to her, and the other girl then opted for the same box simply because she thought it was her friend's favorite. The bottom line of this story is that in both cases, the task that they performed was not one of numerical comparison. In sum, the authors of those two general narratives would have told two very different stories about Ronnie and Renat. One of the stories would be this. The children failed in comparing two sets of marbles according to number. And the other one, this. The children made an agreed choice of a box. One would be the story of what the girls didn't do and where they failed. And the other of what they did do and where they succeeded. As such, these stories would provide the teacher with very different information and thus different grounds for pedagogic decisions. Unlike the first story, the second one would make her realize that the girls might have tried to perform a task different from the one she had in mind. From the second story, she would thus be likely to deduce that in her future teaching, she should try to transform children's interpretation of the question where are there mar where are there more? This would be quite a change from what is implied by the first story, namely that it is just the mastery of a procedure that should be fostered. In sum, this example shows that differences in stories on learning lead to differences in teaching. So if you wonder at why we should talk about talking about learning rather than tell stories about learning right away, here is the reason. The way you talk about learning has a major impact on how useful your narratives are going to be. Back to our initial question on the reasons for talking about talking about learning, my answer now is that if we care for teaching, we simply have no choice. If I managed to convince you, you are now ready for the next, next task, answering the basic question of how to talk about learning, mathematics, and the two of them together, so as to make the resulting stories as informative and useful as possible. The cognitive answer to this question to be given in this unit We'll begin in the next module with a close look at the concept of learning. See you there.